I made the decision um, about a little over a year ago that I really, really wanted to join the Catholic Church. I had grown up in the non-denominational church and I grew up in a house full of love and full of God and I was introduced to it and it was beautiful and it was wonderful. But the thing about the way that church is designed is that it's really easy to fall away on your own. It's really easy to become what I like to call a lone ranger Christian where like, and when you're on your own, when you're isolated from a community, when you think, I don't need a church to have God, it can just be us, it can just be a relationship, it's so easy to get attacked. It's so easy because the enemy loves to pick off the Lone Rangers, the people who are on their own, who don't have that community around them to uplift them and support them. And the more I researched the Catholic Church and attending my first Mass, I was like, this is right, this is good, this is how it's meant to be. And I never had any issues about the way I grew up. I grew up in a lovely faith community. I don't have any church hurt or anything like that. But I was missing something, for sure. And that missing piece is the Eucharist. It's the true body and the true blood and the true presence of Jesus. And everything about the way the church is designed reflects that respect that we have for the Eucharist, saying Jesus is here. It's not just like, oh, he's in our midst, he is here. He is with us. And that means something. And that's why we bow to the altar. That's why we go through all these rituals. And it's not silly to do it all. It's, it's reverent, it's respect, it's honor and tradition. And the past summer, I was visiting NAU with my dad. I knew I was going to go to NAU. My parents went here, my grandparents went here. I have family in Flagstaff, like I have a very rich history from the town. And I hadn't been able to go to Sunday Mass the day before because we were traveling. So I was like, oh, you know, I wonder if there's a Catholic church like on the campus and if they're doing a daily Mass, I'm gonna go check it out and see because he was in town doing business. And I just kind of walked around until I found it because I had done some research and I knew that there was one on campus and I had come like just in time for the 11.30 daily mass and I met Amy and she was so sweet and so wonderful and she was just like, oh my gosh, let me show you around, we're so happy to have you and you can tell that it was genuine, it's not fake, which is something that I think is so precious and special about the Newman Center is that you are desperately wanted here. And it's not like, oh, we want you to be a part of our church because we want you to be saved. It's, we want you here. And all of your problems and all of your past and all of your everything, we want you to be one of us and feel truly, truly loved and welcomed here. So I went to my little daily mass. It was just like a bunch of kind of little old ladies and there was barely anyone there. But the presence of the spirit in the room was so, so, so much. Because there's just, there's something in the silence of the, of the church. Like, growing up non-denominational, church is always like very like bright and flashy and there's like contemporary music playing and there's always kind of like, like the music team in the background like doing like a little like guitar riff as like the pastor is speaking or something like that. There's not a lot of moments of silence. And when I was just in that church, I think it was during um, the consecration and I was kneeling and it was just silent, but yet so full of the spirit. And I knew like beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was making the right choice. I was making the right decision. And that there was something really special here that cannot be put into words that I hope everyone on this campus would come to be a part of. Because how I would describe Newman is there's something nostalgic about it. Like, because we all come into this world knowing God and the most horrible thing that will ever be told, the, the worst lie that will ever be told is that we're not known, that God does not know us, that we are not loved. It is the worst lie, the worst thing that we'll ever have to go through that we were not brought here with intention and love and purpose. So I feel like the Newman Center is so nostalgic in a way of like, it's familiar, it's remembering. It's remembering how God created you and how you were designed and the purpose you have here. It feels like 
summer of 2009 and you can hear like the kids playing down the street and you just got out of the pool and you have a popsicle and the world is great and everything is amazing because we're all children of God. And I feel like here, the best way I can describe the Newman Center is a bunch of broken kids trying to be better. And that includes the elderly, that includes the church leaders, that includes all of the college students. We're all a bunch of broken kids trying to do better. And I think there's something very healing and very familiar about the place. Like, I, I've never been in here before in my entire life, but I walked in and I knew where I was. In the same way that I hope I'll walk into my judgment day someday and I'll see Jesus and it'll be like, oh, I know you and you know me, and we know each other. This is familiar. This is nostalgic. This is where I'm supposed to be. I know this place. I came from this place. I came from these hands. And hopefully one day, if I'm lucky, I'll get to go back. There's so many things that are familiar about um, like church in general. Like That's why I love the feeling of fellowship here so much, is because we are not designed to be on our own. We are not made to just be us and God. That's why he gave us the church. That's why he gave us the Catholic church, is because we don't have to do it alone. Because it's really easy when you're on your own to fall out of accountability and to say, oh, well, God understands. You know, it's fine. You know, we all go through trials and, you know, periods of suffering, and we do. That's right. And they're there for a purpose, and they're wonderful. But also, with the more structure of the church, it's there to pull you out and bring you closer to God in those times of suffering. Like, that's why I think confession is such an amazing concept, because yes, you do need to go directly to God and ask him for forgiveness, that's important. You should be doing that all the time. Like the first thing you think of when you sin is, oh man, I am so sorry, God, and you should bring that to him directly. But to physically say it aloud to another person brings a whole new level of accountability in there. And it's a safeguard against falling back into that because you think, I don't want to tell this person that I did it again. Like, I don't want to do that. You know, something that I heard about the Catholic Church when I was kind of first discerning it is, well, there's a lot of rules. And I was like, oh, man, yeah, there is. And then I started realizing that the rules are there for a reason. The rules are there because God loves us, because he's trying to create a place that holds us accountable, that helps us from not falling away, from not saying, I can do it on my own. I don't need this church. I don't need another person telling me how to have a relationship with God. I can do it on my own, but you can't. We can never, ever do it on our own. We need God. We need fellowship. We need community. We need other people raising us up one of my favorite things ever is like the, how the concept of like iron sharpens iron and how the people you surround yourself with either make you stronger or weaker in Christ. And that's why I feel like getting more involved here, immersing yourself in the community, not just going to mass, but like joining a Bible study, getting involved, like whatever. It makes you so much stronger in your faith. Like it adds just like this little like like extra layer of armor around you. Because you know, like, if I fall out, like if I am having a horrible time in my life and I stop going to mass, I'm gonna have a lot of people texting me being like, girl, where are you at? Like, why aren't you here? What's the problem here? Like, you're always here. Like, are you okay? And that's not coming from a shamey thing of, you miss church. It's coming from a place of, you're not in your favorite place on this whole campus. What is wrong? How can we help you? And I know that in a moment, I will have a whole community rallying around me, lifting me up, holding me when I cannot hold myself. Something that my Bible like leader, my Bible study leader, Emmeline, which I love her so much. She's such a wonderful figure in my life, like truly like that sister, older sister, I've got you, I'm gonna take care of you, I'm gonna lead you. Just someone I can look up to to, to say like, this is how I want to be. This is the kind of person I want to be. This is the kind of woman of God I want to be. So not only am I so lucky to have her as an example, but something that she said to me that really resonated is she was like, this is one of the most important days of your life. Like other than your wedding, like 
this is one of the most important days of your life for your eternal life. The most important choice you'll ever make other than, you know, choosing who to marry and who to have children with. Like, there will be very, very, very few times in my life that even come close to the importance of that day. And something that's really interesting is when I was little, growing up in the Protestant church, my parents asked me if I wanted to be baptized in that church because my sister was baptized in the church when she was about eight or nine. And they asked me if I wanted to be as well. And I loved going to church. Like I was like the little kid that brought my little children's reader Bible along with me. I loved church. I loved Sunday school. I adored it. I adored going to church. But I said no. I said that I didn't want to be baptized in the church because something felt wrong. I was probably seven when I said that, but I said, not here, not now. Like there's something missing. There's something not quite right. And so my parents honored that. They were like, okay, wonderful, cool. Like whenever you're ready, you can do that. So it was so special to me knowing that the one baptism I get is like the true one. It's the real one. It's the one that counts, that I never had an experience before where I thought I was being forgiven and I, I kind of wasn't, or like it was just kind of a little like touch and go sort of thing. But in that moment, I think my favorite thing ever was like lifting my head up and seeing Father Matt with like the biggest grin on his face and I could feel like the joy radiating off of him of like, I am so happy for you. You are meant to be here. You are valued here. You are loved here. This is home. This is family. And the college campus is a dark place. There are so many people in such deep hurt and in deep pain who walk around believing the lies that the enemy tells them, thinking that they are worthless and that they're irredeemable because Jesus gives you hope. Jesus gives you your color back. He gives you your smile back. He redeems you. He makes you feel like you're that kid again and that maybe you're not the worst person in the world and that you can be better and that you do have a future and that wonderful, amazing, incredible person that you want to be, it's possible to become that person. And it's going to take trial and suffering because suffering is an opportunity to become better. And that's hard. It's really, really hard to cope with in the moment. But that's another teaching of the Catholic Church that I love so much is the purpose of suffering in our lives and the opportunity it presents. Because it says, you know what? It, is, it isn't fair that you're in this. That's, that sucks. That is deeply unfortunate that you're going through this pain that you shouldn't have to go through. This breakup, that's not your fault. The grief of losing a family member, that isn't your fault. You didn't do this. But it's an opportunity to take it to God, to unite in the suffering and the passion of Christ and say, I am so hurt and I'm so confused, but I'm going to let this pain carve my character into something beautiful for you to take out of it. Because pain kind of like cuts this chasm into us and it makes us feel empty. And that's just more area for God to grow and more grace for him to give you and to rise up out of the darkest depths because it takes you hitting rock bottom to realize that he is the rock at the bottom and that all of these waves that are crashing against you and all of these sufferings and the trials of life that are crashing against you, nothing will ever, ever be able to shake the power of Christ, the power of God. Because on our own, we don't have that much strength. But a line from one of my favorite worship songs of all time, and there are incredible lines in this song. Um, Rain came, wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe in you. I'm going to make it through. And then it like goes on to say, you know, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. And I love that song. But my favorite, favorite line from that song is, I'm not held by my own strength. And there's just something about the simplicity of that that got to me so much, saying, I don't have to do it on my own. I don't have to be strong on my own. I don't have to take it all myself. I can ask for help. I can bring my brokenness, I can bring my suffering, and I can leave it at the cross and say, I don't know what to do with this, and I need your help. 
So baptism, it's so hard to describe because it's just a feeling like any other. It's just insurmountable grace washing over you, realizing I don't have to believe the lies anymore. I am now redeemable. I am good. And I have the possibility to be great. Because it's okay to have problems, because we all do. But the worst thing is to say, I'm good and I can't be better. But baptism says, I'm good and I can be great. I can be like Christ. And I'm taking the steps I need to. Because the goal of living is not to get to heaven. It's to bring heaven to earth. It's so that everybody can know the joy of Christ and what it feels like to live in his grace and in his glory and in his peace and his kindness. And that was me taking the most important step, saying, I want to bring you here so that one day I might go to you. And just nothing else can describe it. I would have a very hard time putting it into words other than just pure grace and joy. There's such real proof that baptism is the forgiveness of all sin, like mortal, venial, original, all of it is gone because I have never ever felt, because I've received communion quite a few times since getting baptized, like I've been going to daily mass as much as I can just because I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't get communion now. But um, nothing will ever compare to the first time. Like the first time just felt so different. And it's not like the sense of, oh, it feels different because I've never done this before. Like there was just like a lightness on my heart and a lightness on my soul. And like the lightness of like that coming onto my tongue, that was just like, wow, like I am truly free right now. Like I have nothing holding me back. And confession gets to give that to us over and over and over again. But as you know, you know, you fall seven times in a day. And as like, kind of like that little bit of venial sin comes in, it doesn't feel quite the same receiving the Eucharist. So for me, that was just really a, a big confirmation of like, the Catholics have it right here. Like, that's the true body and that's the true blood. And baptism is the forgiveness of sins because nothing will ever come close to like that feeling of being truly wiped free of my past and receiving Jesus. Like, <laughs> mind blown, it was wild. <laughs> There's so much of this that I wish I'd, I'd had from the beginning. Like, one of the most wonderful things about becoming Catholic for me has been um, figuring out a relationship with Mary. That has been just such a privilege and a blessing and an honor to be able to know this wonderful figure, especially as a woman of, who do I want to be? Well, first and foremost, I want to be like Jesus. And who? was right there with him the whole time. His mother, Mary. And who can I look to for guidance? The ultimate, ultimate like display of faith. You know, and like literally yesterday was the Annunciation of our Lord. And you know, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and he was like, you can have God's child if you want it. And she says in Luke, let it be done to me. And that's just something that I really take into my life. And I try to repeat it is just like, let it be done to me. Let it be done. Because I had a really hard time with the concept of submission for a really long time. Like, I am an engineering major. I am an extroverted, like, die hard. I'm good on my own leader girly. So I was like, oh, oh. When I first read that verse that was like, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives as, love, as God loved the church. And I'm like, that's not gonna work for me. That whole submission, mm, I don't know. Uh, that, that seems, no, no. Have you seen the men around here? Like, no, I don't think I need them leading me. Thank you so much. Like, I'm good, I'm good. And then, you know, Mary gave me like a little reality check where she was like, hey babe, another word for submission is faith. It's trust. You know, when a guy opens a door for you, it's not because you can't open the door yourself, that you're too physically weak to open it. It's a sign of reverence and honor and appreciation because we as women have this precious gift inside of us, which is the possibility to literally create life, which is wild. And there are people out there who want to take advantage of that. They want to hurt that. They want to ruin it and take it. 
So that's why this precious gift that we have in us must be protected and led because everything about our nature was designed so purposefully to be nourishers of life and to bring good people into this world. Good, God-fearing, Christ-loving, kind, loving, gentle, strong people. And because we have this nature in us that's like, I don't want to hurt, I just want to take care of you, man. I just want to make you a sandwich and like tell you everything's going to be okay. Like, oh, just let me take care of you. And so we have that nature about us, which is so intentional. But that nature can also lead us astray sometimes in terms of like, oh, I want to take care of you. And it's not the right person to take care of at all. Which is why, like, when we find someone worthy of that submission, a man who puts Christ first and who has his priorities in line and who listens to the word of God, that's when you can say, I could do it on my own. I could open that door just fine on my own. But I choose to let you lead me because maybe you could help me do it better. Maybe there's something here I'm not seeing. Maybe there's a piece of the puzzle I'm not grasping. And this nature in me that is so kind and loving and trusting might be working against me in this scenario because I need to step back and look at who to trust. I need to step back and look at where to go. So Mary has just been such a wonderful, wonderful figure that I got to add into my life of the ultimate display of selflessness. Because something that I was talking about in my Bible study literally just yesterday and that I've been praying about for a little while was I never knew like growing up that Mary was sinless. Like I was like, oh yeah, she's the mother of God, cool. And then everybody just kind of moves on. Um, and I didn't know that she was, you know, like conceived without sin and that she's like totally free from that. And then I was thinking about it and I was like, okay, so if Mary's sinless, that means that Jesus died for everybody but his own mother. That he belonged to the entire world, but not her. He paid the price for everyone, except her. So she was the only one without personal benefit from the crucifixion. Yet she still had to endure it. She still had to watch it. She still had to go through that knowing, I don't need this. I'm not getting anything from this. My precious child, I just want to run up there and say, take me instead, leave my son alone. Take me instead, but she couldn't do that because she knew that the price had to be paid, but not even for her own benefit. And that was just like, so, such a moment for me of like, just ultimate trust in God, saying there's a plan, there's a purpose. I haven't seen it yet, I'm having a really hard time seeing it right now, but it's there and I believe in it. Because Mary was the first Catholic. Mary was the very, very first person to follow Christ, her son. A way I like to think of it is she was the first monstrance. She was the first one to ever have Christ within her and to let that shine before the world. So getting that figure added into my faith life, just this beautiful, beautiful display of femininity and strength. Because something that Madison, one of the missionaries, said to me the other day that made me laugh so hard is we were talking about like the strength of Mary and she was like, Mary wasn't a pansy. Like she gave birth at a barn and then walked all the way to Egypt and did all this stuff. Like she's the ultimate display of you know submission and faith. Yet she was so incredibly strong as a woman because in Christ, being Christ-like versus being of the world is like very paradoxical because we think, oh, being strong is like anger and like rah and like unforgiveness. But we know that in Christ, that strength is gentleness. That it takes strength to look someone who hurt you more than anyone else in the world, to look them in the eye and say, I forgive you and mean it. And say, you know what? This one's on me. You can do it. You can hurt me, I can take it, and that's okay. And I love you, and I think you have purpose, and I think that this is not who you are, and that you're redeemable, and I'm not gonna hold it against you. That's strength. The same way that like submission, that isn't weakness, that's strength. And 
the world teaches us these ways and it kind of ingrains all these horrible things in our society like as a man you need to be this and as a woman you need to be this and as a person you need to be this and do this and this is what this looks like but when you get into the word of God and when you get into the faith you kind of unlearn all those horrible lies that you've been told about this is what you have to be and this is what this must be and you start learning the way of Jesus and it's hard it's really hard sometimes you know some parts of the faith come easier than others it's really easy for me to do like oh the, the peaceful part and the service part and even the forgiving part I tend to be pretty good at that one I'm like okay cool but then there's like that one thing that I have where I'm like, oh, you can't have that. I don't want to give that up, please. And he's like, well, it's me or them. It's him or the world. It's eternal life or temporary bliss. And I'd rather choose the hard path, but the right one. Because the world is very like this. It's very entertainment everything kind of trying to get your attention. And something that I grew up on is kind of the concept that's pretty popular in a lot of Protestant churches and specifically a lot of Southern Baptist churches is the idea of prosperity gospel. And prosperity gospel is this concept that like, because God created us as like the best of the races and like to be the apex predator and stuff, that life shouldn't be hard. That being a Christian shouldn't be hard. And if it is hard, then that's your fault and you're doing something wrong. Cause like we were made to be the best and the kings and all this stuff. So if you're suffering and if you're having problems, you're probably not reading your Bible enough. You're probably not praying enough. Like that seems like kind of a you problem because the devil tells us that life is easy. That life should be simple and full of joys and it shouldn't be hard and you shouldn't have to go through all these horrible things. Why would you be so hard on yourself and resisting temptation? Just give into it. Life should be easy. It's okay. And then when those problems arise, the devil tells you, well, there's a lot of complicated ways to get to a solution. Like, okay, you need to go through this and you need to do this and you need to, you need to go here searching for the right answer and you should go here, you should go to the bar and to the club and all these places and then, and then maybe you'll have a solution. But Jesus is the opposite. He looks you in the eye and he says, this isn't going to be easy. This is going to be hard. Life with me is not easy. Life with me is hard. It is hard to resist temptation, to choose the narrow path when to lose friends, to lose relationships, when you choose to be like Christ, and when you choose to follow his will and to follow his way. The life is hard, but the solution is easy. The solution is God is good. Simple. Because if you believe that, and if you immerse yourself in that, and if you repeat through the pain, God is good. God is good. God is good. This pain is here for a reason. It's here for a purpose. It is only here because God allowed it to be. He took his hand back and allowed it to be placed into my life. There is nothing that is stronger than his hand. So this pain has a purpose. This pain is here for a reason. I'm going to rise up out of this. I'm going to become better. I'm going to become stronger, nicer, gentler. Maybe this is what it takes to let go of that really, really deep-rooted part of myself that was sinful or just not who I want to be. And maybe this is what it takes to let go of that. So learning the language and learning the patterns of the world and of the devil versus the patterns of God, when you understand that, when you say, life is hard, life isn't easy. There will be times of you know joy and where it's going to be easier, where it's going to be a smooth pass, path when you are like sitting in your gifts and you're, you're sitting in the reward and the miracle and you're like, wow, this is great. And then you're going to be in times when you feel like you have nothing. And when you are in such deep sorrow, in deep pain, and you're confused. But the solution is simple. And that's why the path of God will always be a million times better than the path of the world. Because I'd rather have a hard path with a simple solution than an easy path with a complicated one that ends in death.